Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to continue on with the quantum theory of angular momentum. In particular, we're going to get into the explicit eigenvalue and eigenvector problem for angular momentum. In particular, we're going to do three things. We're going to compute the eigenvalues for j squared and j3. We're going to compute eigenvectors that are simultaneously eigenvectors of j squared and j3. We know we can do that. We know they exist, so therefore we can devise a scheme to do that and come up with the common eigenbasis since j squared and j3 commute. And then we're going to use these eigenvectors to compute uh, matrix representations for the components of J in certain physical situations. And we'll describe that once we get to it. So before going on, I need to establish a little bit of notation and some technical details. We're going to denote the eigenvalues of J squared by a h bar squared, a is a real number, and the eigenvalues of j3 by m h bar. So the question is, where did these factors of h bar and h bar squared come from? Well, this is going to help us make connection with the physics literature and with little John's notes. So it's important to do in this particular situation for angular momentum. So angular momentum is a physical quantity it has units, and it so happens that a that h bar and j have the same units. So what we're going to do is scale the eigenvalue of j squared by h bar squared and the eigenvalue of j3 by h bar, and in that case, a and m are dimensionless. And that's useful. So, also we see that uh, this shows the real power and utility of uh, the Dirac notation, how efficient it is. We have a simultaneous set of eigenvectors, so we're going to denote them by ket am with an a and an m denoting eigen vector for j squared and eigenvector for j3. Now, we're going to assume that there are no degeneracies. We'll come back and look at that situation later because it is important in rotational type motion, but that means that um, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between eigen values and eigenvectors. The normalization condition was then right like this. So that should do it for the notation. So we're going to define ladder operators. Now these are La remember, ladder operators are another name for raising and lowering operators or creation and annihilation operators. Little John uses the uh, terminology ladder operators and will follow suit. So there are two ladder operators, J plus, go up, J minus, go down. J plus is J1 plus IJ2 and J minus is J1 minus IJ2. Now, J plus and J minus are not Hermitian or so of a joint, but they do satisfy a nice property. So J plus adjoint is J minus, J minus adjoint is J plus, and you can verify that easily from their definition using the fact that J1 and J2 are self a joint. Now, I call attention to my shorthand notation. I write, and rather than writing out two different formulas, I just combine J plus and J minus into a single formula. 
Hopefully that is clear what I mean by that. I just stack the indices and you, you see the order from top to bottom makes sense. The order top to bottom on the left is the same order on the right, but that should be clear from the context. Now, commutation relations between the ladder operators in J3 and J squared, as well as the ladder operators among themselves, are crucial. And this proposition gives us essentially all the results we need, and it is the heart of the theory that we're going to be developing. So, these should make sense if you stare at them enough. First of all, it should be clear that j squared commutes with j plus and j minus. If it's not clear, think about it, look at the definition, and what you know about j squared commuting with the different components of j. This last relation is very important for understanding how j plus and j minus act on eigenstates, because we know we don't necessarily know how they act on eigenstates because they're eigenstates of j squared and j3, but j squared and j3 are on the right hand side and this equality connects them. This will be very important. And the first and the third are fairly straightforward calculations. Now the proofs of these are included here in detail. But you see, for one, the first one, you just write it out. So the commutator J3 with definitions for J plus J minus use linearity, the fact that, uh, that uh, constants can be pulled out. And then what you know about the commutation relation for J1, J2, and J3. And that's what, that's that we took that as definition for the quantum angular momentum operator. The three the Hermitian operators or self-adjoint operators that satisfied the commutation relation. Okay, the other are very much the same. That was the easy one. J plus J minus will be an important one, and we just write this out. I don't go through this in detail because at this stage of the course, if I just point you in the right, right direction for these things, and that all, you know, I really shouldn't be, have to do much more than a statement of that proposition. This should be fairly easy for you to fill in the details for the calculation, and you should go through these and check them. Now these last two are just multiplications but you do end up with a commutator and the commutation relation. And the only difference between j plus j minus and j minus j plus is this plus and minus. And I always remember that because the uh, factor on the left gives that to me. Okay, that's a good place to stop. Now, next time we're going to pick up with a calculation which uses all of these results, which effectively unlocks this entire theory, whatever that might be. Okay? So, until next time, see you. Bye.